Hi, this is Sharon Cluck, and I'm coming to you from Farmington, Missouri. This is actually um, our, our Sabbath teaching this week, and we're talking about who is the bride. We've been talking about this for a number of weeks, and I actually did a teaching on Hear the Watchman this past week, and it hasn't come up yet. So I wanted to share this with our little congregation here, and so we're, I'm going to go ahead and go over this again. But uh, last month when we were in Utah at the Women's Warfare Conference, I taught on something called Two kingdoms. And that was an amazing conference with a tremendous follow-up response. I'm still getting information on people that wanted personal contacts because it was information they had not been given before. The reason we do these conferences is because in many of the church congregations, warfare is not being taught. Many people uh, have an attitude, even the even the surveys show that many people that are Christians don't even believe that there's, that there's a devil. So when bad things happen to good people, they don't have a, a paradigm to weigh that with and to understand that's because they have an enemy. So when you devote your life to Jesus Christ and you make a commitment to him, you automatically have an enemy if you know it or not. So that was the whole paradigm shift that a lot of those women had to face that, that were in Utah is to understand that they do have an enemy and there's a the reason why they come under attack and that bad things happen to good people. So uh, the presence of God was so thick there that when I entered this meeting hall, that all I wanted to do is just fall to my knees and just worship the Lord. The people there had really done their due diligence in getting ready for that conference and praying and interceding. The preparation, the place was just spectacular. The, the walls were covered with uh, uh, it looked like it had actually been painted on the wall, but they had projected a woman wire up on the wall, and it was just beautiful. And it was even projected on the, the foyer when you came in. You had to walk over this woman wire, and then there were lights that shone on the floors and shone in the ceilings. And it was probably the most spectacular conference setting I had ever seen. And so to be able to teach in that atmosphere was just a beautiful thing. Thing. I didn't have to work to bring down any kind of darkness. It had already been taken care of for me. So I really appreciated all that those women did ahead of time. So there was a prayer room there that was designated for ministry. And we actually expected that prayer room to fill up or to start having people coming in sometime during the day. But to our surprise, by 10 o'clock in the morning, the first break, that prayer room was filling up. And we were dealing with people that were really having some demonic attacks within their household and people even that were attending congregations that were dealing with very demonic effects in their life. And so as we began to minister, there was just no uh, question that the Holy Spirit just penetrated that room. Everybody in that room knew that there was a presence of God there. And he was delivering and setting people free. And people were having instantaneous healings. And they left that place with their lives changed. So we saw God move in instantaneous healings and life change before our eyes. And the days that followed that conference were filled with numerous teaching opportunities. There were just spiritual hungry women all over the place. And they actually caused some really profound conversations. They had really good questions. And I can't say that I had all the answers to those questions. But what they do with these questions is they start, start me searching. And when I did this teaching the other day on who is the bride on the watchman, that was followed up with some more videos about are there three raptures. And so I looked into that. And we've been discussing that this morning because, again, I'm looking for truth. I shared this the other day. I'm not a nerdy girl. I'm a private investigator. I'm constantly looking for the truth. And if I have to dig for it, it's like the pearl in the field. 
I don't care how long I have to dig in order to find something. When God spurs me on that, that's the direction I'm going. There's a bit of tenacious tenacity within me, a little bit of bulldog in my bloodstream, I think. And I commented that I had a daughter that was like that. My daughter was a death investigator. And we both kind of had the same viewpoint. We were always looking for the bad guy or the bad thing, trying to set people free. So one of the conversations led to this conversation. Jen from Chicago said to me one night, so Sharon, do goats equal tares? So I understood immediately what she was talking about. But when I returned to Missouri and I asked another group that question, do goats equal tares? To my surprise, they didn't have any idea what I was asking. They just kind of looked at me like, huh? So sometimes we assume that people, other believers, are beyond where they really are. We think they understand what we're saying. And I have had that experience many times before. Um, when I came into the whole understanding of, of Sabbath and keeping uh, the holy days, I felt like that all those people that I was fellowshipping with must have got through the same way I did, that they were probably born again at some time in their life, spirit-filled, learned about demonic things and, and power and authority, and that they were then finally walking into a greater and a deeper understanding of Torah and, and the feast days and so forth. What I found out is that wasn't true. And many of those people had skipped over a whole bunch of stuff in their life, and they latched on to the legalism of things without other, ever understanding the spirit and how God's spirit has been moving from Genesis to Revelations. Grace has been in operation from the very beginning or none of us would be here. <laughs> Excuse me. So sometimes we think we're on the same page when in reality we're just not. And there may be large learning gaps in a person's understanding that sets us all apart in our thinking. So when Jen asked, are the unwise virgins goats or tares? Well, I found this to be really a thought provoking question. And so I answered her back with a question of my own. And I asked her, well, tell me this. Who's the bride? And she responded, well, we're all the bride. All of us that are in Christ Jesus. And I believe that that is a general concept of most Christians. We all believe that we are the bride. So then my next question was, well, if we're all the bride, then who are the guests? Who are the guests at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Who is Jesus going to prepare a place for? And how do we know who the bride is? And how do we know who the guests are? And well, the short answer comes out of Revelation 19. And I know that people have already got their Bibles open with me on this because they did it ahead of time. So we're going to start in verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down, and they worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants servants. That's a key word we're going to look at in a little bit. Servants. And ye that fear him, both small and great. Verse 6. And I heard were the voice of a great multitude and a voice of many waters and as a voice of a mighty thunder is saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigns verse 7 and let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted 
that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Righteousness. Not all saints are walking in righteousness. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. So one of the things that I taught in, in Utah on the two kingdoms is this, that we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. So we are not flesh and blood human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having an earthly experience. So if we are a spirit, having a soul, mind, will, and emotions is your soul, and we live in a body. When we are born again, we are 100% righteous. He says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it is your spirit being that gets born again. Your mind, will, and emotions has to be renewed by the word of God, and that takes time. Your body is not going to be redeemed until you get a glorified body. When you get born again and you look in the mirror, you look exactly like you did the day before. Unfortunately, some of us glow a little bit more, but for the most part, we look the way that we did. Our bodies did not change. Our will changed to a point that we have invited Christ to live inside of us. And when we ask him to do that, our spirit is 100% righteous. But until our will, our mind, will, and emotions, our soul is renewed by the washing of the water of the word, then we are not spirit-led people, and we're not living out that righteousness. So when I say some of us are not living righteously, I'm not talking about us not being righteous. Our spirit being is righteous, but it's the acting out are the demonstration of that righteousness that some of us are missing out on. And that has to do with what the bride does. She makes herself ready. Obviously, there's something that she has done to prepare for this wedding. Now, no bride on this earth would just plan on having a wedding day without adorning herself without planning for her attire, without planning for all the things that she wants to be beautiful and made perfect and lovely for her beloved. It's the same thing with the bride of Messiah. She will take all the things that God has given to her. We have all of these wonderful gifts that he's given us, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the spirit of understanding and might. We have all these wonderful things that God has given us to prepare us to become that bride. But are we making use of those things? Have we ever learned to move in those things that God has given us to adorn us, to prepare us to be the bride? Or are we just taking for granted that once we're born again, we have our golden Willy Wonka ticket to heaven? <coughs> Excuse me. Obviously, there's something this bride has done, this one wife has done to make herself ready. So in verse nine, it says, and he said unto me, right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. So there are those who are not the bride, but that are called to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he says, these ones are blessed. So even if you're not the bride and you're invited to the marriage supper, you are the blessed. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. So from those scriptures, we can see that the wife is the one who made herself ready. Well, what does that take? What does that entail? How does she make herself ready? Well, we saw in verse 9 that blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
So somebody here is the bride, and then there's others who are the guest. And apparently not everybody is the bride, and not everybody is the guest. So let's look at Isaiah 25. I'll give me a moment to move over there. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to look at verse 6, 7, and 8, and 9. And it says, on this mountain, Mount Zion, and this is out of the Amplified, the Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all of his people to welcome his reign on the earth. A banquet of aged wine, choice pieces, flavored with marrow, of refined aged wines, and on this mountain he will destroy the covering that is cast over all people and the veil of death that is woven and spread over all the nations so this is the moment that Yeshua reigns on earth and he destroys death I would venture to say that many of us didn't even know this scripture existed. We think all this stuff about the marriage supper of the Lamb is all New Testament and in the book of Revelations. So let's look at verse 8. And he will swallow up death and abolish it for all time. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And he will take away the disgrace of his people from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, indeed, this is our God for whom we have waited. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Waiting, watching, observing, looking, being prepared. Waiting that he would save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us shout for joy and rejoice in his salvation. Wow. This sounds like a pretty amazing event. But it doesn't sound like these people are the bride. In other scriptures, we see that the guest at the wedding are required to be adorned in wedding garments. So we're going to look over now at Matthew 22. In verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who had previously been invited to the wedding feast. But they refused to come. I think before taking time to go in all that, that most of us that know the word already have an idea who might have been invited, who refused to come. Verse 4. <coughs> And then he sent out some other servants saying, tell those who have been invited. Look, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatty calves are butchered and everything's ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They disregarded the invitation, treating it with contempt. And they went away, went to his farm, another to his business. Do you think about that? The farm and the business were probably given to them by the Lord in the first place. The rest of the invited guests seized his servants and they mistreated them, insulting and humiliating them, and, he, and they killed them. Verse 7, the king was enraged when he heard this. He sent his soldiers and he destroyed those murderers and he burned their cities. And then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. But those who were invited, they were not worthy. So go to the main highways and lead, that lead out of the city and invite the wedding feast, invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Those servants went out into the streets and they gathered together all the people that they could find, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests, and they were sitting at the banquet table. 
But when the king came in to see the dinner guest, he saw a man there who was not dressed appropriately in wedding clothes. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without wearing the wedding clothes that were provided for you? And the man was speechless and without excuse. And then the king said to the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In the place there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding teeth over distress and anger. For many are called, invited, and summonsed, but few were chosen. So even the guest had an obligation to be prepared. He was given garments. He was given what he needed to be prepared, but he chose not to be prepared. So when a king is planning a wedding feast for his very own son, it's a really big deal. The king always provided wedding garments for all the guests who attended. He expected everyone to show up in proper attire. You don't want, you know, they invited the bad and the good. They went into the highways and hedges. They didn't want the homeless and the street bum to show up in his street bum clothes to his son's wedding. He's already disappointed that the ones he invited in the first place have treated his invitation with disdain. And so this feast that I'm putting on for my own son, I expect everyone to show up prepared and ready. So he wanted the man to be properly adorned. So you as a believer should be adorned in such a way that the world recognizes that there's something different about you. You're supposed to have a distinguishing mannerism that should set you apart. You are the redeemed, the one who is chosen to be prepared for the king's return, either the bride or the guest. We have to be prepared. The customs of weddings in that time was for all the guests to gather and to dine together in the banquet. And then at some point after sundown, the king would appear. And that would be the highlight of this celebration. Something that every guest anticipated and looked forward to with really great excitement. The king was going to show up. So in this parable, we see that the king is greatly disturbed that someone's entered the banquet that doesn't bear the adornment that's required. If the guests are required to be adorned, how much more will the bride be expected to be adorned? We can look further in this story, but the point here is that there is a great day coming and that to be invited, even as a guest, is a truly great honor. So now we're going to look at the ten virgins in Matthew 25. Can I? Yes. That's the difference between the bride and the guest. He doesn't have to take the bride and get her all ready. She prepares herself. The others, he has to take care of. That's very good, Ben. Thank you. Uh, now, if you heard what Ben said, <clears throat> he said maybe that's the difference between a bride and a guest, and that is that the bride made herself ready, whereas the king had to provide adornment for the guest because they had not made themselves ready or heeded to the invitation when it was first given. So in Matthew 25, verse 1, it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. So we don't have to decide for ourselves if some of these gals are not got it all together. It tells us that. Some are wise, some are foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no oil with them. And so we know, according to Proverbs, the word is a lamp unto our feet. 
so did they all have lamps? Yes, they all had lamps. <clears throat> but did they all have oil? No. And the oil represents the power of the Holy Spirit, that intimate, right relationship with Yeshua. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, while the bridegroom tarried. And we know in all of these parables who the bridegroom is, the bridegroom is clearly Yeshua. Why he tarries, they all slumber and they sleep. And at midnight, there was a, a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Verse 7. Then all these virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. Our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, not so. Lest there not be enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. And while they went to buy, so obviously they knew where to get it. But they hadn't gotten it ahead of time. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and he said, Verily, I say unto you, I know you not. I think that would be a terrible thing to have the Lord say to me. Watch, therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So what we know for sure on this parable is that the Son of Man is Yeshua, it's Jesus. He is the bridegroom. But who are these virgins? Well, it appears that they're part of the bridal party. That's what it looks like. Even though they'd been invited to the wedding, not all of them were permitted to attend. And that goes right back to the parable we just read, that there were all these people that were invited, but just because they were invited didn't mean that they actually intended. So again, the key is here that five have made themselves ready, but five of them had not. So... This is where I want to bring this down to in this teaching, a place where we can begin to understand who is the bride, who are the guests. So the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelations is this profound love story of the bridegroom who lays his life down for the bride. At Mount Sinai, Yahweh laid down the provisions of the ketubah, or the marriage agreement with his bride, Israel. For all of us that have studied together, we already know that we are grafted into Israel according to the things that the Apostle Paul has told us. They are the olive tree. We are an, a wild olive tree. And we have been grafted into them. So the promise is to them. And the fact that they were originally the bride has come down to us as believers in Yeshua. We have the opportunity to be the bride. We talked about this a little bit before we started, that when the scriptures say that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. And so when you look at that word elect, that word elect means favorite and chosen. And we just read that many are called, but not all are chosen. So at Mount Sinai, we see Yahweh give the provisions of this is, I want you to be my bride, Israel. I want you to marry my son. And these are the provisions that I will make for you. 
We have all these wonderful promises in Deuteronomy 28 that you're going to, you keep my provisions of my covenant and I will bless you coming in. I'll bless you coming out. I'll bless you in the city. I'll bless you in the field. I'll bless you in the storehouse. I'll, I'll bless you in the field. I bless you. I bless you in every way. Your your kind or your cattle, they'll they'll not uh, lose their young. Your fields will be plentiful. There'll be rain in due season. There'll be none of these sicknesses on you that were on the Egyptians. He wants to provide for you. He wants to be a wonderful, great providing bridegroom for us and he's made all these provisions for us and all he's asked of us is to be faithful and to be ready and watching so through the birth death and resurrection of jesus we have been grafted into israel we are part of this amazing plan to live eternally with our creator and king in an ancient Mary proposal, there were four parts. So hold on to your hats. You're going to learn something new. It's very much like the Passover meal, where there are four cups in the traditional Passover celebration. In the book of Revelations, we see the scripture that says, Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. He says, if you open to him, he will come in and he will sup or dine with you. Most of us see this as our salvation experience. And that we open the door of our hearts that we received Yeshua and he come to live inside of us. But there's another perspective. He is the bridegroom. He is knocking to present you his future bride with the opportunity to accept his marriage proposal. With every covenant that you make or that they made in the Middle East, there was a meal with those covenants. They broke bread. And so he's saying, if you open the door to me, because a bridegroom comes and he is expected, he and his father come, they make this agreement with the future bride and her family, and they seal that covenant with a meal. He's saying, can I come in? Will you receive me as a bridegroom? And can we dine together as we seal this covenant? The ancient proposal began with the bridegroom and his father entering the house of the future bride. Their coming has been prearranged, and the marriage covenant is a culmination of three previous types of covenants that are recognized by the Bible. They are in the order of number one, first, is servanthood. That is acquired through a blood covenant. The next one is friendship. And the third one is inheritance. The final covenant in this marriage agreement is the actual marriage covenant that happens at the time of consummation. So when the bride and groom, or the bridegroom, when the bridegroom arrives at the home of his chosen intended, he comes with his father. He has a betrothal cup with him, a cup to drink out of. He has wine, and he has a pouch of money, which is the bride price. And together, he and his father, they knock. Before opening the door, the father of the bride would be sure that he had the approval of his daughter. He would wait for a nod, and then he would open the door. They would sit at the table, and together, the whole family would hammer out all the terms of this agreement or this covenant. So, opening the door to the bridegroom was the very first step towards making this marriage happen. And that's what Jesus is saying in Revelations 3.20. You open the door, he comes in, and the restoration process 
begins. We all look at this as though we have this salvation experience and that's all we need. But there is a restoration process for humankind that just begins at the moment that you open the door. It continues throughout your entire time on this planet. At that point, when you open the door, you have salvation. But beyond that, he's asking if you will walk in a loving relationship with him as the bridegroom. So the choice is yours. In an ancient bridal agreement, the bride was only uh, the only one that could still back out of this wedding. Right up to the day of the ceremony, the bride could back out. But once the bridegroom made a covenant, he was bound for life to do what he had agreed to do. So, once they worked out all the details of the covenant, they would dine together and they would drink the first cup of wine. Actually, the very first cup of wine they would usually drink as soon as he got into the house and the entire family, everyone that was there would drink that cup of wine together. So the first cup was called the cup of sanctification, which equated to a servant or a blood covenant between the two families so when they drank this wine that wine represented blood that they were agreeing that they would covenant together it is consumed by the entire family all the members that are present it's an agreement to become one big family together each family is agreeing to serve the other family. It is a cup of servanthood. So when we come into the family of God, when we receive him as our master and Lord, we are agreeing to serve him. It is the cup of servanthood. That blood covenant brings us into a position of servanthood. But that is just the first step in our walk or in our preparation as the bride to become ready, to make ourselves ready. So cup number two was a cup of bargaining, which represents the salt covenant between the two families. The cup is consumed by the fathers and the bride and the groom. So just the two fathers and the bride and the groom consume the second cup. They are covenant between each other to become eternal friends. So in Philippians 2.12, it tells us we are admonished to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. When we accept the Lord's offer to servanthood, it is to mature then into friendship. In this part of the agreement, the bride agrees to remain pure and all the details of what the groom will provide are established. It was his responsibility to go to prepare a place, <clears throat> excuse me, for his new bride. So this is how the salt covenant worked. Every male carried a little pouch of salt with him. Salt was considered very, very valuable. You've heard that saying, well, that guy's really worth his salt. Well, that's because salt was actually a monetary system. Even the Roman soldiers were paid with salt. So they all carried this little pouch of salt. And when they would make a salt covenant with someone, it was considered an eternal covenant. This was not one that had an end, like your last will and testament, that when you die, that last will and testament is done, it's been satisfied. A salt covenant is an eternal covenant. So each person would take a little bit of salt and put it in, in the container. The other one would put it in the container. So each one of the, the fathers did that. And they would mix that salt together. And then they would take bread and they would dip it in the salt and they would partake of the bread. That's how the salt covenant worked. The point is, when you mix the salt, you can't unmix it. You can't tell one from one grain from the other. So as a family, 
They have pledged to be eternal friends. Even if something happens that this wedding doesn't take place, these two fathers have agreed that they will remain friends and have each other's back for the rest of their lives. That is the second cup of the contract or of the covenant, the marriage covenant. So cup number three is called the cup of redemption or the cup of inheritance. And this is represented by the sandal covenant and uh, signifies the sharing inheritance of the marriage partners. It's drunk at the end of the meal by the bride and groom only, and it symbolizes their exclusive commitment to each other, along with their increasing level of intimacy. It officially seals the marriage agreement between the two of them. So because I'm not going to take the time to tell you all the people that actually are required to sign and to seal this agreement, let it suffice to say that every marriage contract had seven seals. You had scribes, you had rabbis, you had two fathers, you had the bride and the groom. There was a total of seven seals on this contract. Is it any mystery to you that when you open up the book of Revelation, the first thing that we are confronted with is the fact that there are seven seals on this scroll and that nobody is worthy to open it except the bridegroom? pretty amazing. So we have that marriage agreement between them, and it has seven seals. So let me explain the sandal covenant. It's called the one of inheritance. If either the bride or the groom die before the wedding, the other one would inherit whatever their betrothed owned. Everybody had planned to come into the wedding with, doesn't matter if they live or die, that belongs to the other one. They have agreed to this inheritance. So think about this. At the Last Supper, we see all of these cups. All three of these cups are partaken. There was the cup of salvation through the blood that will be shed for them for their redemption. There was the salt covenant and that they would dip the bread and eat the bread, which signified their eternal friendship to one another, all of the disciples and with Jesus himself. And then Jesus further left his inheritance with his disciples when he had them all remove their shoes and he washed their feet. He gave them the power to use his name. He left them an inheritance. And even though he dies physically, they have been given the inheritance of all that he has left in the power of his blood and of his name and of the victory that he has had over Satan. So once the marriage supper or the marriage agreement is made, it was customary for the groom to never drink wine again until he drank it on his wedding day with his bride. Think about that. When Jesus finished that last supper, he said to his disciples, I will not drink of the blood of the vine again, the fruit of the vine again, until I drink this with you in my kingdom. And he went to prepare a place for us, for his bride. What we're doing every time that we take communion, we are making a recommitment to pursue him to be his friend and to manage his estate, 
to obey him, to follow his rules and his ordinances. And the commitment that we make at communion is to be the same that his disciples made with him and as a bride made with the groom, to be faithful, to be prepared, to make ourselves ready. And the last cup of this marriage agreement, the fourth cup, would be at the marriage supper itself, when the bride and groom only drank of the last cup. It was called the cup of praise. And this cup allows all those who are chosen as the bride by Yeshua to partake. It will be taken on the wedding day and will forever seal Yeshua's union with his beloved. Then you have the traditional smashing of the cup for those of you that don't know that. This is how that happens. Becoming part of the bride doesn't happen automatically. Many Christians assume that salvation alone is all they need to become one with Messiah. So this is how the last cup would be. As they partake of the marriage supper, they both drink from the same cup, just like they did the betrothal cup. Now they partake of the cup. They both drink of it. And once they both drunk of it, it's placed on the ground with a napkin attached. This bridegroom will lay his foot on it, and the bride will put her foot on top of it, and they will smash that cup to smithereens. And that is indicative of that no one except the two of them will ever drink from the same cup that they belong to one another, and that cup of matrimony, that cup of the covenant, was made for the two of them and the two of them alone, meaning that they would be faithful and exercise fidelity throughout the rest of their lives to one another. Salvation equals salvation. It means you get to come to the wedding which in itself is amazing, but none of us that can be a guest and be a bride at the same time. So the marriage covenant is the culmination of the previous three covenants, servitude, friendship, and inheritance. It's offered to all of us, but few of us will accept its privilege and its responsibility. So before I close, I'll tell you a couple of things that are remnants in our society from the Sandal Covenant and other things that you'll recognize from the Bible. Did you ever see the old movies where people got married and they got a just married on the back of their car and they've tied all these old shoes to the back of their car? Mm -hmm. That's from the Sandal Covenant. That implies their inheritance that they have one with the other. Um, the Hebrews would use their worn-out worn sandals to mark the boundaries of their property, and then they would put stones on top of them to hold them in place. No one would ever think about moving one of those. They, it, was, it was terrible to remove an ancient landmark or to move a property mark because they were moved. They were, they were marked with sandals. Inheritance. People knew that was an inheritance. On Mount Sinai, when we see pictures of Mount Sinai, we see all of these feet print that were drawn around. And God said, everywhere that you put your foot, I've given it unto you. And so what did they do is they, they put their foot down and they carved in the rock around their sandals, depicting this is my inheritance, sandal covenant. This is my inheritance. It's been given to me. In the book of Ruth, Chapter four, you have the kinsman redeemer, Boaz, who asks for the hand of Ruth. In order to get her, he has to go to the person who's closest related. And how does he give her up? The kinsman redeemer, he says, I'm not going to marry Ruth. You can have her. What does he do? At the city gate, he takes his shoe off 
to Sandala, and he passes it to Boaz, meaning I give you my inheritance. Ruth would have been my inheritance. I give it to you. There's a really nice movie out called Loving Leah. And in that movie, uh, her her husband is this woman, Leah. Her husband is a rabbi and he dies. And her bro the rabbi's brother is supposed to marry her. And when he decides not to, he has to give her his shoe. Ultimately, he can't do it, and he ends up marrying her. It's a happily ever after story. But this plays out even in some Hebrew uh, circles, even today. When Moses met God at the burning bush, what did he tell him to do? Take off your shoes. This is an inheritance. So servanthood and friendship and inheritance the idea is that you progress from a friend a servanthood to a friendship and as a son or daughter that would inherit salt was used for money it indicated your worth and the sandals indicated your inheritance and this is the scripture I gave you earlier from Luke 22, 18, where Jesus says to his disciples, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God has come. We are, as brides of Christ, expected to serve him and to serve one another. We're expected to move from servanthood to friendship. We sing that song, I am a friend of God. But are we? Have we sworn eternal friendship to him? Do we have covenants with one another, with his people and his body, that we would have their back no matter what? Do we even know what that means? And have we learned through the inheritance that he left us to use his name? to walk in his authority, to have his power of attorney, to prepare ourselves and to adorn ourselves as his bride. So somebody's got to be the guest and somebody's got to be the bride. And I pray that every one of you that are listening to this will make it a priority in your life to make yourself ready regardless if you're the bride or if you're the guest. And that is how we will find out who is the bride. So I am praying for each and every one of us to be prepared to be looking up because our redemption draws nigh. So thank you guys for listening. You can uh, find us at uh, www.mindofmessiah.com. You can reach me at Sharon Cluck at mindofmessiah.com. Or you can leave comments, press the like button, and the share. And thank you for watching, and God bless you all.